Welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this weekly program, when I have the great privilege to introduce to you men and women who've made the journey of faith following Jesus Christ into the Catholic Church. There's a verse in Sirach, chapter 4, a very challenging verse that says, Strive even to death for the truth, and the Lord God will fight for you. Strive even to death for the truth, and the Lord God will fight for you. That verse in many ways describes the journey of my guest this evening, John Barger, who is the founder and publisher of Sophia Press Institute. Many of you may have read his books. How many books have, has Sophia pre published so far? It's about 85, I'm not sure. 85, I think you said you're about ready to sell your millionth book. Right? Next month. That's a great, uh, great uh, celebration. But his search in following the truth, at whatever cost, led from atheism into the Catholic faith. And he'll talk about that in a moment. The theme for tonight's program is that question of uh, Pontius Pilate. What is truth? How do we determine what is truth? We've talked about that before in this program, but you know it's a very important reoccurring theme, especially in this day and age of indifferentism, or a commitment to relativism. How can you have a commitment to relativism? That's kind of an oxymoron. But how does one determine what is truth? We'll talk about that tonight. Remember, your phone calls are important for this program, so you can call us at 1-800-664-5110 or send us an email at journeyhome at EWTN.com. John, welcome oh, to the nice Journey to Home. Thank it you. It's great to have you here. It's a privilege because your books that you publish are very helpful uh, for so many that I work with who are on their journey into the church. I'm grateful for that. Which I know is part of your goal for the reason for Sophia Institute. Yes, I'm trying to give back a little bit of what's been given to me. Um, it's very odd that I would be publishing Catholic books. It's the last thing I would have predicted uh, <laughs> when I was young. Well, why don't you begin, as we usually do, and give the audience a bit of a background to your spiritual journey. Okay, I'll, I'll do it in brief. Um, I grew up in a non-religious home. As a young child, age 8, 9, and 10, I was interested in knowing what was true. I think that was a gift that was given to me without me asking. Uh -huh. I seemed to have it more than most people around me. I never was satisfied just to play and ride my bike. I did play and ride my bike, but, but I couldn't find it. Um, I had a strong ethical sense, too, when I was very young. I wanted to do what was right and wanted to be good. Um, I, my father used to say that he... Uh, he beat me a lot, which is true, and people would say, well, why do you beat him so much? And he seemed like a, such a good kid, and my father would say, that's why he's good. So I wasn't perfect, and <laughs> uh, I don't bring myself here as an example to anyone. Uh, but we were unreligious. We had no religion in our family, uh, lived from day to day pretty much. Were your parents falling away some things, or they just didn't have it? My they mother had been a Catholic when she was young, but when she got married to my father, who was Methodist, uh, the church wasn't willing to have them married. My father wouldn't become Catholic, so they stopped going to church. Uh, we did briefly go to the Baptist church when we lived in Mississippi. Uh, my dad was in the military, so we traveled a lot. Oh, yes. I was baptized by the Baptist in southern Mississippi in Biloxi, left after three weeks because uh, kids were telling dirty jokes in Sunday school, and I thought that somehow there was an incompatibility. I wandered for a long time after that. In high school, uh, I was surrounded by a lot of uh, Christians who were in young life. I don't know what denomination yeah. they would have been in. That's Amazing. a new denominational outreach oh, in is itself, it? yes. Well, I, I wanted to know what was true, and so when they claimed to know what was true, I would argue with them. But I always had a problem. They would say, it says here in the Bible or there in the Bible, you should hold this position. And I said, why should I believe the Bible? And they would say, well, because it says right here in 1 John or 2 Corinthians, unless you believe, you shall not be saved. I said, but give me some reason. You have a circular argument here. Yeah. They never were able to answer that for me, so I wrote off Christianity pretty much. I went to college, went to the University of Maryland in 1965. I took a course in ethics, still looking for the truth. We went through five or six different ethical systems. John Stuart Mill, Aristotle, Kant, I forget who the others were. At the end of the study, we would uh, summarize what the philosopher had said and go on to the next. They contradict each other. Yeah. I wanted to know what was true. The philosophy course didn't tell me that, so I despaired of that. They probably made Left it worse, didn't it? I mean, pitting these other... Yes. And just kind of canceling each other out. Yeah. So I left there, and I, uh, that was 66 I left there. The anti-war movement was heating up. 
I went to Antioch College, which was at that time one of the most radical colleges in the country. I sought truth there uh, in, a, in a radical studies institute and fell deeply into hedonism because those people also didn't seem to be able to explain to me what was truth and uh, have any criteria that would uh, substantiate it. Learned to smoke dope, learned to drink, lived a wild life, thought that if there's no truth, why not live a wild life? And uh, finally dropped out of college in April of 68 and got drafted, wound up in the military. I continued to seek truth, but I drank and sought truth. So I would read Gandhi. I became a vegetarian in the military during the war and starved to death eating salads. They don't provide <laughs> veggie foods in the uh, chow hall. I read Malcolm X in the military, looking for truth there. Uh, still couldn't find it, so I'd look for truth and drink. I read uh, uh, Merton, Thomas Merton, yeah. Seven Story Mountain. It mm -hmm. was very moving. I had borrowed a motorcycle and went out to Our Lady of Mepkin Abbey in South Carolina and hung on the gate. A monk came by and I said, he said, what do you want? I said, I'm looking for God. He said, you need to talk to the guest master. Talk to the guest master. What can I help you with, young man? I'm looking for God. You need to talk to a priest. I got disappointed, so I left that. Uh, I'd given up on education. I'd given up on the little bit that I saw of the church. I wound up getting married to a lady who herself was Catholic at that point uh, and said the rosary and said novenas and went to mass and wore scapulars and I thought that was strange. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I guess that's really that it caused lots of problems as a matter of fact in our marriage because I had no respect for that and I would try to get from her the reasons for these things and she wasn't so good in giving them to me and of mm. course I was a skeptic and a relativist and a, an alcoholic. Which so probably intimidated her. Exactly and I had a fierce temper and mm. And I think that those years of dissolute lead living had somewhat blunted my genuine desire to know what was true. And that's where I stood, uh, that's where I ended up being on the brink of the church. If you look back, if our topic is what is truth, and if you're searching all these years for truth, how would you, given in those days, how would you have discerned if you had found it? How would you know what was true or understood finding of truth? And how would you know if you, you know? Well, there was only one area where I saw that truth was being discovered that was incontrovertible. And this may be distressing to some of your audience, but it was in science. Mm. Science seemed to be able, and I think it still can in many ways, discover the properties of matter in such a way that a transistor can be made, a computer can be made. Mm -hmm. uh, oxygen and hydrogen and nitrogen can be manipulated to make a different kind of... Uh, uh, substance to help sick people. So they were clearly discovering more and more about the natural world. But science says nothing about God. Science, uh, some scientists do. But science itself says nothing about God. And outside of science, I found no criterion whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So I guess I was uh, an atheist of sorts, or agnostic, a seeking agnostic, seeking atheist, using science as the criterion for truth. And of course, that excludes the church, yeah. excludes Christ. Had you gotten to the point of believing that science could explain it all? or No. You? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it can't. Yeah. That's why I drank. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, then in the midst of that, um, what were the, some of the things that got you interested in the Catholic Church and drawing in that direction? It, it's the search for truth again. Uh, I had a wife. I wound up with a child and a wife. I was looking to leave the military in a year or so. I decided that I needed to get a degree, so I went back to school. I was in Charleston, South Carolina at the Citadel part-time as a, as a non-cadet student. And I took a course in semantics, which is the study of language. And the professor there introduced, he was a Catholic, though I didn't know it, he introduced Aristotle. And we studied Aristotle's rhetoric and logic. And logic is the study of how ideas relate to each other and the conclusions that necessarily follow one from another. So if I say that um, uh, all dogs are brown, uh, Buster is a dog, therefore Buster is brown, mm. it's incontrovertible mm. that Buster is brown. If the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. Mm. And 
we studied all sorts of forms of logic like that, and I discovered that outside of science, outside of the experimental method, there was another area where things hmm. could be true, hmm. and that was logic. Hmm. And we went further in other philosophical questions and discovered other areas in which truth can be known. And in this case, it's not known by scientific experiments, doing a test over and over and over. When you see that sequence of ideas, all dogs are brown, Buster's a dog, therefore Buster's brown, you see it immediately. You have a direct mm -hmm. insight into the truth of that, mm -hmm. and it cannot be otherwise. So that was the first time in my whole life, I was mm -hmm. 27, when I saw that there was an absolute truth that could be known yeah. with certainty. I felt like I'd been treading water for 27 years, and finally had touched a rock, a foundation someplace, and it was a joy. My, uh, my wife continued to pray rosaries and continued to do Catholic things and to encourage me to look at Catholic things, but uh, I wasn't so interested. The church seemed medieval, it seemed unscientific, these seemed primitive ways to live. Uh, but I made friends with my professor and he invited me over to his house. My wife and I went over his house one time and it turns out he was Catholic. And I remember being there at the door and seeing the icons on the wall and the holy water font and saying Kent, his name was Kent Emery, can't be anything but a Catholic. <laughs> I finally have made some progress in this life after 27 years and now you've betrayed me because hmm. you're medieval, you're, you're out of touch with the reality, etc. And he continued to feed me books and to talk to me after class. Uh, one of the books he fed me so, so at this point, I, I still saw that science could find truths, but as I said earlier, it's limited. Mm -hmm. Now I saw that the mind, through philosophizing, such as in logic, could come to see things that were absolutely certain as well. Mm -hmm. So science was no longer the, the sole standard. There was a second standard. But still I believed in evolution, I believed there was no God, etc. And then. Uh, uh, my professor gave me a book by G.K. Chesterton, and books, I guess that's partly why I'm a publisher, can move souls yeah, yeah. very, very effectively. The book by Chesterton was The Everlasting Man, and in it, it do I have time to tell a little bit about yes, that? Yes, please, tell about the book, because uh, some an, of the audience may want to... It's an eye-opening uh, book. Uh, some of it's dated, but he talks about the discovery of the paintings in a cave in France. The cave is called uh, Lascaux, I think, L-A-S-C-A-U-X. If you go down to the depths of the cave, on the ceiling there are paintings of buffalo and deer and um, other animals, and they're very lovingly done. Hmm. And in those days, if you picked up a book, it would say that these were the works of primitive souls, cavemen, who lived down in the depths in the darkness, Probably they were somehow totems that they worshipped. Uh, somehow they were uh, people observing a primitive religion. And Chesterton says in this book, it's a marvelous little passage, he says, well, that's what an evolutionist would say. But suppose a priest and a boy were to go down to that same cave and look at it. What the boy would see would be a beautiful picture, and you should get these paintings sometime and, and look at them. Of, of animals jumping, and one of them, he says, is a deer that's leaping, and the deer is looking back over his shoulder, and he says it's a very hard thing to paint, as any mm -hmm. painter knows, to get the, the form right. This is not the sign of a primitive soul, but the sign of an artist. Mm -hmm. And it may be that they, 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 they ate meat raw, it may be that they uh, uh, wore, wore uh, furs um, of animals they killed with their teeth, but they were artists. Mm -hmm. And Chesterton goes on to say that art is the signature of the human spirit, mm -hmm. that there's no place anywhere in the world where you find a human being where you don't find things decorated. So, for example, I mean, this is not staged. This is decorated. It doesn't have to be in hexagon or whatever yeah. it is shape. And this is decorated. Mm -hmm. And the ties we wear, everything we, we do, we ornament. Mm -hmm. And nowhere, he says, in the animal world do you find that. You don't find the most primitive... Uh, cat scratching out primitive pictures and a more advanced cat doing more advanced pictures. Mm. And I thought, my golly, there is something different between men and human beings. So these are, we can talk more about that maybe later, but I, I had my scientific confidence shaken. 
I got a new confidence through Aristotle and logic, seeing that there was truth, and then my confidence in evolution was shaken by Chesterton showing us what the human spirit is and how d different it is from the animals. Mm -hmm. And then they gave me a book, Christopher Dawson's book, The Making of Europe, in which he showed that the the ethical intuitions that I'd had since I was young, the sense of right and wrong, and the principles, primitive they were, that I live by, um, were really a remnant of Catholicism which dominated Europe for the mm. first 1500 years. Mm. I think in, in the making of Europe, Dawson says that the the sense of natural right and wrong or the natural law that many people talk about well, no, I don't want to say that. that. That many of the ethical principles of our culture are hangovers from Christendom and particularly Catholicism. So yeah. that made me realize that, that maybe there was something about the church. Hmm. Maybe the church had contributed something to civilization. What I took for granted, the church had been enunciating for 1,500 years hmm. before the Reformation. So that opened my eyes to the church to look into it. And of course, my godfather was, he, he became my godfather, was a Catholic and my wife was Catholic. So now these mumbo jumbo voodoo things they were doing, maybe there was some rationality there, some reason to take them more seriously. Um, also when I was young, as I was a candy striper in a hospital and I worked in a lab and sometimes when little babies were born prematurely they would be brought into the lab and I I was, I don't know whether you want to say privilege or not, to watch an autopsy of a little baby one time. A very tiny thing, and the, the, the orderly I worked with, when the baby came in, took out his comb and combed the baby's hair for the doctor. Mm -hmm. And I would see these little babies at, well, this was an older baby, probably 14 weeks, but I would see them at 9 and 10 mm -hmm. weeks, clearly human. And at that time, the church was the only voice in the culture there were a few Protestant denominations that were saying that abortion is wrong. And that was something I could see very clearly. Yeah. So that gave me another reason to look toward the church uh, because her ethics, at least in the grosser things, the larger things, seemed to me to be true. Yeah. And my, my, uh, my future godfather and my wife kept feeding me books and talking to me about these topics. And I explored more and more the ethical notions that the church has, some are very subtle, but no matter where I went, I saw that the church spoke truly in an area where I could know the truth yeah. of things. This isn't revelation yet. This isn't faith. It's finally that the church in one area is speaking truly, and she spoke truly about history, too, mm -hmm. and about the human spirit. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that's what opened me up to mm -hmm. inquire into the church. Um, that's not yet faith. That's right. <laughs> we need this step of faith. I was wondering what imagine at this time your wife is, is she becoming hopeful? Is she becoming excited yes. what she's seeing happening in you? Yes. And you're also talking about a kind of a, a journey of the mind. Yes, exactly. It's also confronting you in the heart. Yes. Other aspects of your life. Well, I was living still a bad life. I was drinking. I was bad to my wife. And, and I was seeing these things to be true and knowing them to be true. And they were convicting me to use probably a Protestant term of my own life being bad. So I was trying to, to, uh, become better though that was very hard uh, they urged me to to convert I hesitated I fought I remember a dinner one night they were talking about how Peter has the keys to the kingdom and I said there weren't keys in those days just shooting my mouth off <laughs> there was a flurry of discussion well of course there were and I said prove it and they got out a book and there had been keys for 500 years 2,000 years beforehand I was flailing about <laughs> because when you have a an institution such as the church, which has stood for 2,000 years and has a unity of teaching, both in doctrine and in ethics, morals and, and doctrine, and has been assailed by the Roman Empire and not changed, by the Reformation and not changed, and now by the modern world, which is getting very aggressive in its attacks, then you have something that has to be looked at very seriously. I wish that in the 60s when I was a hippie that the church had spoken more loudly hmm. and forcefully. And it also given greater attention to reason instead of simply asking people to, to uh, make an act of faith. And I don't say that reason can ever substitute right. for faith, but there are reasons to have faith. Yes. 
And the Protestants that I was dealing at the time, with at the time, who were very good people, uh, some of them I still know are very good, nonetheless were involved in a, a failure to place a good foundation under what they believed. Mm. Now I've, I had found it. Um, I was sitting at the table one, t one day reading probably Chesterton or Belloc or one of those fellows. Maybe it was Cardinal Newman. And it's the only religious experience I've ever had in my life. I realized as I sat there that I was being given a choice. Call the priest now and say I'd like to join. Or if I didn't call, the offer wouldn't be given. Now, I don't know what to make with that. <laughs> but I reached for the phone and was baptized. And it's been a long struggle since yeah. then. Because that's not the same as being knocked off a horse the way St. Paul was. I wasn't given a, a dramatic experience of Christ face to faith, mm -hmm. face to face. But I don't think it's illegitimate. No. Because what I found in the course of that year or two is that the church is worth trusting. Um, an analogy that I give some people when they challenge me is that my father was on Guam during World War II. Do I know what he did there? No, I wasn't there. I wasn't born. He speaks about Guam. I trust him. Why do I trust him? Because in other areas where he's spoken, he's spoken truly. So I know that when my father speaks, he speaks genuinely and he speaks truly. So if he then chooses to speak about something that occurred in Guam in 1941, I have no reason to doubt him. In fact, I have reason to believe him. In the case of the Catholic Church, the sequence for me was this. When it comes to ethical matters, the church speaks truly. When it comes to Christ in the Bible, and I trust the Bible because the church says that the Bible is trustworthy, Christ is an exemplar of virtue, more sublime than anything that the classics had. So, so whereas uh, magnanimity was what Aristotle praised at his greatness of soul. The great man was generous, but he wasn't humble. Christ talks about humility, which yeah. is a much deeper and harder virtue. I saw the church had the answer there, and Christ was the model. And if she could be so subtle and wise and true and good in the face of all those onslaughts, then if she said Christ was God, hmm. who am I to doubt? <laughs> now, that's not the ordinary course, but it's legitimate grounds for faith, because you have faith in some person. In this case, it's the person of the church. And that's how I got from being an atheist to being a um, <laughs> Catholic. But the, your journey reminds us that the Lord uses a great variety of the ways to reach us because we're a variety of people. Some people need to get knocked off their horses. Others, it's different ways that our hearts and minds are touched. And, but I'm also thinking about your journey since and knowing through what you publish and edit that it didn't remain merely mental. No. Because um, another verse in, in the same chapter of Sirach says, do not be ashamed to confess your sins. My guess is that in this journey, there was an issue of being driven to recognize the need for the change of life, trusting the church in that, being driven to your knees. Sure. When you talk about that only religious experience, being driven to your knees well, is a powerful religious ex reality. Yes. Um, I left the Citadel. My professor said, you're studying literature, but it's because you want to know what's true. You really ought to be in philosophy. I said, I looked at philosophy in 65. There's nothing there. He said, well, go study it at this Catholic school. I went and got a doctorate in philosophy uh, and then taught at a Catholic college, a somewhat conservative Catholic college, for six years. And I would go and teach my students uh, philosophy and I would come home and drink, and I would come home and scorn my wife, Susan. And the, the contradiction grew very great in my life. And one day I, I put down the bottle of wine and said, wait, no, not again. And I was given the grace of sobriety. I haven't had a drink for, I don't know, 18 years or so. But being driven to your knees, yes. Uh, I tried to repair my life. I tried to make up for all the bad things I'd done to her and my children. And we became best friends, and she got cancer. I don't think I've told you this. She got no. cancer in 86 and died in eight months. Oh, no, you didn't. And I spent that eight months simply caring for her mm -hmm. and trying to be kind to her. Mm -hmm. um, 
And pretty much everything was taken from me. And then I simply lived a dark night of the soul, pretty much caring for my seven children at that time. I married again a few years later and have taken as my own call simply to give myself away and not to ask anything for myself yeah. in any way whatsoever, which is a hard call. Yeah. Yeah. But in the morning when I wake up, that's what I do. Yeah. But because the grace is given for that too, though. Yeah. And, and I think that's what we're all called to do. Whether, we get, whether, we, whether God speaks to us and, or we speak in tongues or anything, that's the call. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's clear that that's what Christ did. That's what we're called to do. So, yeah. Well, talk a bit about Sophia Press Institute. I mean, this, in, in essence, is an extension of this journey for you. Yes. We originally set it up while I was teaching to, to uh, publish Catholic philosophy because we strongly feel that there needs to be a good philosophy in order for there to be a good theology. If you don't know how to think clearly, right. if you can't follow logic, then you're going to wind up falling into uh, many of the foolish philosophies out there. Mm -hmm. And foolish theology. And <laughs> foolish theologies, yeah. because if you, if you don't know how to make distinctions, then where there's a need to make a distinction, um, you're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's easy. Uh, uh, those high-level theologies and philosophies that you find in St. Thomas Aquinas, in uh, St. Augustine and St. Bonaventure are essential to fidelity in matters of faith because faith gets uh, complicated. Uh, we started to publish them. There wasn't much money for it, but I also saw in my own life the need for reformation and change, and I thought, well, there are a lot of political battles in the church. How about if we do works of spirituality? So I've given the last 17 years of my life to essentially a kind of spirituality for laymen. Uh, most of our books are on that level. Mm -hmm. Because whether you are for communion in the hand or not, you need to be kinder to your child or to your boss or to your mm -hmm. wife, and you need to pray more. I was thinking that you had mentioned in your own journey that it was a book by Chesterton, a book by Dawson, mm -hmm. that it so influenced your thinking as well as Aristotle. I mean, these are books that for many times are out of print, yes. which is part of the goal of Sophia Press, yes. bringing the good stuff yes. back. Yes. That had such an influence even in your own life, yes. so that our children can have these again. Yes. And it's a nonprofit institute, so I mean, it's committed to this goal. Yes. Um, if you were, we're going to take a break in a moment. If you were to ha give any advice to any of our audience who have children or friends that, where, that are where you were, what can they do, what should they do to open their heart to the church and to, the, uh, to, to Jesus Christ? Well, I, I at present have 12 children. Um, that's why I look tired. <laughs> <laughs> and although I know that there are a few who, if they see this, will say, yeah, you hypocrite. I'm sorry, kids. The, the first thing to do is to be kind to your children. And that's the first thing that any parent should do. Because you, if you're not kind to them, it doesn't matter what you say. They're going to write it off, whether it's true or false. The second is if they ask a question, Try to give a full answer insofar as you understand it, and don't slap them down for having asked a question. When I was teaching, I had a lot of kids from very conservative Catholic families. I tried to get them to ask questions. They said, well, no, it's wrong to ask questions. And I said, there are two senses of asking a question. You can ask a question in order to challenge someone. You want to you stop them from, from uh, pursuing that, that train of thought. Or you can ask a question in order to go more deeply into things. Mm -hmm. And that's what questions are good for. They help you understand things. So I would say encourage your children in coming to a deep understanding. The world is all around us. It's even in our own minds. There's no way to drive down the street without being affected by the values of the world. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you need thoughtful children who are going to be out there and able to cope with these things uh, by thinking them through. Mm -hmm. um, there aren't that many good books out there right now I can <laughs> recommend. Yeah. A couple by Sophia Press. Uh, well, and we're <laughs> going to do some more good ones that will be aimed at young people, too. Excellent. And apologetics, things like Patrick Madrid does and others are very helpful, yes. too, and the things that you're, you're doing. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, John. I'll tell you, stay with us. We'll be back in a moment for your questions for John and this issue of what is truth and how can we dis discern what is true and how we can make sure we can communicate that to our children. See you in just a bit.
Welcome back to The Journey Home. My guest is John Barger, the founder and publisher of Sophia Press Institute. And I'm sure you may have seen many of his books. It's, and they're not just in Catholic bookstores, right? No, they're in Borders, Barnes & Noble. They're all over the world. We sell them internationally. And, and we're doing more and more uh, sales overseas and into secular bookstores. Which is, fits the goal. You know, taking the truth out. Yes, I engage in, in something a, which I call stealth Catholicism, which is an effort to not simply preach to the choir, mm -hmm. but to reach out to people like me who were on the outside. If I, if the church had, uh, maybe I said that had been more prominent, if she'd shown the reasonableness of her, reasonableness of her views, the goodness of her truth, I would have been in much earlier. Mm -hmm. So we deliberately package our books in such a way that they won't be off-putting to a Protestant or to an atheist. We uh, put on them titles that offer benefits, uh, you know, Bearing Your Troubles Well is a, a sample title. Uh, we always choose books that are accessible to the modern reader. We don't presume that they know lots of theology. We don't presume they're even in the church, generally. Mm -hmm. And these are a kind of evangelism. Why is it called stealth Catholicism? A lot of people are allergic to Catholics mm -hmm. or to priests. And so on the outside, we won't put, it's by Father Romano Guardini. We'll just put Romano Guardini. We'll put a bright uh, jacket on it, a beautiful jacket. We, we always publish to the highest professional standards so that the secular bookstores, even those that don't like Catholics, will take them in and put them there. Hmm. And we're having some success. Oh, that's, that's great. Let's take our first caller. Um, uh, hello, what's your name and where are you calling from? Hello, my name is... Spencer Lett, and I'm from Alabama, and I have been told that uh, your daughter did the first covers for your book, and I wanted to know if it was true and how you came to choose your daughter. Uh, <laughs> I didn't choose my daughter. She was born. <laughs> God did that. Uh, it's true that she did the first covers for my books. Um, she's since moved on to other things, uh, but it was a tiny family business. I was teaching school at the time and painting houses during the summer. I had a PhD in philosophy, but needed money because in small Catholic schools you don't get paid very much. And so uh, I said, there's got to be a better way to live than this, mm. which I was wrong because publishing is a worse business than painting houses. <laughs> At least you can, you can make money painting houses. <laughs> but you chose your daughter rather than a professional to do your first art work? Well, yeah. 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 She, Talk about, isn't part of this publishing in stealth Catholicism, as you call it, that this artwork is a very key part of that, yes. isn't it? There's an old Thomistic principle that's probably outside of St. Thomas, too, that you should wrap the truth of things in the sweetness of beauty. And the truth and beauty are deeply related. They're part of the fundamental qualities of all of creation and of mm -hmm. God himself. And we make it a point of finding beautiful jackets uh, for our books to and draw it, people to. And it. Noble knowing, jackets. It involves knowing your audience, too, yes. or what would be offensive or yes. attracting to that audience. Exactly. That's very important. Let's take our first email. This is from N. Sir. Uh, dear John, how was it that Chesterton's distinction between the human and animal spirit made a difference for you when other books that said the same thing did not? And this has got two questions. Also, can you give a specific example on how you live your, quote, rule of not asking for anything? Let's deal with the first one. How did Chesterton's distinction? I, I explained how Chesterton talks about art being the signature of man. And he goes beyond that. He says, look at the birds. The sparrow that's singing this morning is singing the same song that sparrows sung in Siena or Vienna, or Beirut 200 years ago, 300 years ago, 400 years ago. There are no styles of music with the birds. The nest that the sparrow builds is the same style that was built 50, 100, 500 years ago. There's not a Baroque nest that comes along and then later on there's a Romanesque or a Romantic nest and some sparrow doesn't decide that he wants to, to be more classical in his things. The animals, he said, are fixed in their character. Uh, there, there's no history in the animals. And when you th compare that to human beings, there's not only art as the signature of man or woman, I don't mean to exclude women, but 
art changes mm -hmm. according to time and culture. So we have styles, and that sets the human uh, being apart from his animal contemporaries. You had a good analogy or, or a symbol you were going to use. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I taught a class on this once. I said, you want to see how animals are different from human beings? I taught a whole class on this. I said, uh, uh, hold up a dollar bill. You know, if, you're, if you're there in the audience, take one out and look at a dollar bill. And you can teach this to your kids, how the human being differs from the animals. And they're not alike at all. On the front of this, <coughs> um, and I had to make some notes here. First of all, this is, this is, this is a, a tool of commerce. Animals have no commerce. They don't have businesses. Uh, a, a sparrow or a snake in Argentina doesn't set up a factory to produce mice that is going to ship off to uh, North America. But this is a symbolic tool of commerce. You don't have any kind of commerce among the animals. Um, the second thing is that it's itself an artwork. We, we've, we've polished this up to make it pretty. And then uh, right here it says this note is legal tender for all debts public and private. Public and private is a philosophical notion. You don't find philosophical notions among the animals. Legal, legal tender, a system of laws. And what are laws in this case? Not the law of gravity which pulls you down whether you want it or not, but a system in which certain mandates for action are set up, and if you don't follow them, you're punished. Animals don't have that. What else is on here? It says Washington, D.C., right over here. Um, that's a political place. It happens to be a capital. Animals don't have capitals. It's a named place. Animals don't name things. No animals have ever named a thing that I know of. You've got clothes on this fellow here, George Washington. Animals don't have clothes. And you have styles again. We don't wear those ruffles anymore. Again, animals are, don't do these things. What else is on here? Um, I'm looking at the back because I made some notes. There are symbols over here. There's a, a scale and there's a key. The scale has to do with the justice. Animals don't have a notion of justice or courts of law in which they try to adjudicate justice. There's nothing like that at all. Uh, over here back again, it says all debt, public and private. Animals don't engage in borrowing and lending. This is a bank note. Animals don't have banks. What else is on here? Um, numbers. There's numbering. Animals have no numbering system. Who would think that an animal was like a, uh, like a, um, uh, a human being? What else is on here? History. Washington. There are no histories. Chester says no histories in the animals. They don't talk about uh, Bozo, the big dog who defeated uh, <laughs> Freddy, the dog, th three years ago or ten years ago. Okay. When flying here, you look down on the earth and you see the signature of man, lights and commerce and roads and things. It was just it just blew me away. Uh, the the most primitive cat does. I said that doesn't scratch an image of of a, of a less primitive cat. Art is the signature of man, but all of these things so too. It's a fascinating study to yeah. recognize. And sadly, we live in cultures <coughs> where, where people presume that humans are just uh, animals shouted loud. You know that we've just look. I mean, look on the back. In God we trust. Is there an animal religion? Do you know of any shrine that any animals ever made? No. Yeah. That alone would set them apart. Languages. There are two or three languages on this. Uh, uh, e pluribus unum. There aren't animal languages. They make sounds, but they're not languages. It goes on and on. I don't see how anybody yeah. now could. Okay. Thank you for that, because that'll be something <coughs> that these parents can use. Before we <coughs> lose that last email, one, how about a quick comment on, he asked about the rule of not asking, about living out that rule. Well, it's, it's a simple thing, and it's a hard thing. And it, it has to do with the next choice that you make. I come home tired. My wife says, John, it's been a rough day. Can I go in the bedroom for a minute and just sit? And I want to say, hey, I'm <laughs> tired. But I grab hold of myself and I say, sure. And it's that little mm -hmm. half a second in which you want to thrust it away that you take charge of. Mm -hmm. And you do that in every single thing. Mm -hmm. And there are, I, I'm a boss. I have 15 or 16 employees. And to be selfless this way while having to 
uh, tell people what to do and sometimes admonish them, I find to be excruciating. But it, it's the same thing, always treating another person as a human being with needs and sufferings and always trying to deny yourself. Mm. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you need to get sleep in order to function. And that's mm. licit, but only in order to function. Uh, and even that in itself isn't selfish. <coughs> that's doing that's it right. Because you that's have work to do to serve exactly. the Lord. And, and so if you find people. yourself getting snappy with your kids or w with other people, then in order to serve properly, you have to say, well, now I need to rest. So it's really, a, I say, a hard thing and a simple thing because you have to be constantly alert. If you're not, you'll fall. But also it has to do with being patient with yourself. Mm -hmm. If you fall, well, fine, I pick myself up. Okay, excellent. Let's take our next caller. Hello, what's your name and where are you calling from? Hello. Hey, this is Mary from Fort Lauderdale. Hello, Mary. What's your question for us? I would love to know, John and Marcus, what to say to an atheist when the subject of religion comes up. It seems like it always catches me off guard. Have you got any, oh, a four spiritual law kind of a thing to, <laughs> to, that would be suitable for any occasion? Thanks so for much. For an atheist. Thank you, Mary. I would, I would first ask, why are you an atheist? Because it could be that they're an atheist because they've examined all the evidence and they're very lucid and rational. And if that's the case, you've got to look at the evidence they've examined. Or it could be that they're an atheist because their mother or father tried to beat religion in them when they were young. And so anything having to do with religion, they dislike. And giving evidence in that case isn't going to help at all. Could be they're an atheist because they don't understand the claims of religion. So I, my first question would be just to ask them, why are you an atheist? And listen. Uh, and then you'll know which direction to go in. Until then, there's no one formula. Are there other reasons why people might be atheists? They might not want to be good. Yeah. You know? Well, there are many that would claim that there are, in reality, no atheists. Mm -hmm. In reality, there's maybe agnostics, but in reality, an atheist is, is, is taking a real stand yeah. you know, against something. And are there any true atheists in yeah. that sense? Uh, and there may be some books that we could recommend if they're readers, you know, like, like mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. Is a good that, book that's that an excellent book to that give to deals people. at this level, uh, at that level of apologetics. Do you want to speak to her a minute about that, or should we let... Well, that's a wonderful yeah. book uh, that but was you popular don't, during can. the... Why don't you can go on to two about that? I used book. to use a book by C.S. Lewis called Mere Christianity in an ethics class I taught at a college. And the merit of that is that he begins by writing to people who may not believe and he starts with the ethical law. He gives this example and this is the level in which he operates and it's good for people who don't have lots of background. He says, when I get on a bus and I move toward a seat and someone jumps in my seat, I say, hey, wait a second, that's not fair. And I'm appealing to a standard of justice which is non-material and I expect them to see it too. And he goes on from there to talk about the natural law, which everybody knows. He proceeds that way. And only toward the end does he even get to Christianity and why people would ever consider it. Lewis says that's an excellent... Uh, yeah, a good place to start. You know, yes. and it's, um, in fact, I remember some... It seemed like he used the illustration in there of the possibility of atheism. And that is, what's, what's easier to prove? That there uh, is no spider in this room? Oh, or yeah. that there is a spider in this room? Yes. Okay, well, you, to prove there is no spider in this room is Almost nearly impossible. impossible. Yes. So to say there is no God is an, is an impossibility. Yeah. Okay, but to, to show that there is a God through the experience and the truth and is, is a different issue. Let's take, our, uh, take an email. This is from B. Or if it's Aunt B, it just says B. Dear Marcus, John's story is inspiring. Many members of my family have struggled with alcohol abuse. I was wondering if his conversion added him, aided him in overcoming this addiction and if he had any advice for me. Day after day, it is so difficult not to fall into despair. Thank you, B. Well, the first thing is if you're an alcoholic, don't drink. That's the first thing. But you're not the alcoholic, you're living in alcoholics. And I, I've done that. And I've had no success, not my wife, but other people in the family, I've had no success talking people out of alcoholism, none whatsoever. Even people who are 82 years old and ruining their life, I, no success. In my case, it was easier because I was teaching Catholic ethics. I'd go into class, having yelled at my wife, 
having been mean to my kids, and I would teach about the virtue of humility and the virtue of gentleness and self-effacement. And every word I said to those young people who looked up to me with trusting eyes was two-edged. It mm. stabbed me and stabbed me and accused me. That made it easier. But I think that may be another case in which I was given the grace of simply stopping. Most people have to hit bottom. That's my understanding from that. Yeah, you have to hit bottom and realize you've lost everything. Um, I would talk to people in AA, though, and I don't know if there were problems with AA. Years ago, they used to be pretty good. Yeah. I think there were even some Catholic foundations to AA in the beginning. I'm pretty yeah. sure. I don't know a lot about the background there. Let's take this next uh, caller, I mean, next email, excuse me. Uh, and I think this deals with the issues of, of, uh, of, the issues of science, because uh, the author he mentioned here is uh, a, a, a Catholic, quote, scientist. Dear John, have <coughs> you read any of the writings of Stanley Yaki? Uh, I asked because you mentioned your interest in science as being a key to your not falling away from seeking the truth. For Catholics or Christians interested in studying science, where should we begin? May God bless you. I have read a little bit of Father Yaki's work. It's hard for me. I'm a, I read science as an amateur, not as a professional. And he writes very, very mm -hmm. professional stuff, very good stuff. The science that I read is not Christian. I read books on astrophysics, the ones that are on a more popular level, books on biology, by biologists about biology. Why do I do that? Because I don't want people with an agenda. I just want scientists who are reporting what they've discovered. And some of the discoveries of science in the last 50 years of my lifetime are amazing. I don't know whether or not most Catholics are aware of what the current claims are in science about the origins of things, for example. Um, go get a book on astrophysics, which has to do with the beginning of the universe. I have a book called The First Three Minutes, for example, which is just about the first three minutes. The consensus in science these days among professional scientists is that the universe began, they give a date, 12, 14 billion years ago. They talk about what happened a thousandth of a second after the beginning, one minute after the beginning, three minutes after the beginning. This one book only, is only devoted to the first three minutes. But they claim that science demonstrates incontrovertibly that about 12 to 15 year, billion years ago, matter came into existence from nothing, space came into existence from nothing, and time came into existence from nothing. Now, when I was a kid, mm -hmm. they didn't say that at all. Yeah. They talked about an eternal universe or this or that, but now that's the consensus. Now, that's the Thomistic mm -hmm. position. That's the position of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the honest ones say, how can it be that all of this came into existence and following the, the laws of chemistry and physics, if those laws didn't somehow precede the coming into existence. Mm -hmm. And they say, we as scientists don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. But they talk about creation. I, I get a kick out of the creationist, anti-creationist arguments. Science as it's practiced today is creationism in the sense that they say the universe was created. It mm -hmm. came into existence out of nothing. They just can't speak about a creator. Yes. Yeah, they don't go there. They say, why? Well, yeah. my brother's a chemist and my brother has no access to um, the content of stars. He's not an astronomer. So an honest scientist says, I have no access to that. Um, they leave that blank, and you, but, you, but I will say in a challenging way, though, that, that some secular science does have an agenda. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. You're not just saying, grab, go no. to the secular science. No, not because at all. Some of it certainly does have an agenda. Yes. Uh, and which is, in some ways, why much of science got where it is Carl today. Carl Sagan yeah. uh, had a show called Cosmos, when was that, 20 years ago, in which he is a scientist, and he did some legitimate science, stepped right into philosophy and theology and spoke with what he saw to be authority, and it was yeah. nonsense. It was nonsense. But that was because he was speaking not as a scientist, yeah. showing what his experiments had shown, but as a philosopher, a pseudo-philosopher, a theologian, mm -hmm. yeah. 
But if you just go to the raw stuff, that is the, 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 the real science, they don't yeah. get into that. Yeah. It might be good to make a quick comment about the relationship of the Catholic faith and science. Because there are many that think that really Christianity and science, by definition, should butt heads. And that was what kept me out of the church for a long time because my Protestant friends were very wary of science and very wary of reason. And I thought, if God created the universe, how can his revelation be inconsistent with what we can discover about his creation? Mm -hmm. Revelation is one word, creation is another word. The, the second word happens to be material and laws, etc. But they all both come from God. They cannot in, be uh, inconsistent. If they're inconsistent, it's either a failure of theology to study and understand what's being said or a failure of science to see what's being said. The Catholic position is there is no incompatibility between science and faith. Mm -hmm. And that when it happens, either we've not thought it through or we lack evidence. Okay. And that's, that's, uh, that's a hallmark of the Catholic Church that sets it apart from other churches, too. Another thing that drew me to the church. Mm -hmm. In fact, as Catholics, we would want to encourage our young men and women to go into science yes. and to be uh, Catholic voices with precisely him, and the best scientists they can be. Because if you have Catholic scientists, when someone like Carl Sagan gets up and says foolish things, a legitimate scientist can say, wait a second, you've stepped outside the bounds of biology or outside the bounds of physics now, Mr. Sagan, come back. And this, the Catholic scientist will be listened to, whereas you and I won't be because we're laymen. Or when that scientist wants to step outside the bounds of ethics and morality, exactly. you know, in the issues exactly. of genetics and yes. things like that. Well. Uh, in closing, John, I want to talk to you about uh, uh, your journey involved a lot of mind, reason, philosophy. Coming in the church involved seeing the church as that deposit of truth that we could trust. Talk about how your journey since has helped you discover also the spirituality of the church. Um, that's a broad question. Um, the church asked a lot of us. Christ asked a lot of us. Um, I told you my wife died, and that's no easy thing. She was 39. Um, one son has diabetes. There are many sufferings, lots of miscarriages. I'm sure in your family, I'm sure in your family, uh, the people watching the show, there's lots of suffering. Christ gives the means to bear those sufferings. He doesn't give those sufferings without giving the graces. and. Although I don't have any daily experience of existence, I know that when things have been rough and I've simply said, all right, God, I don't understand this, but I'll do what you will, not what I will, that it's always been far better than when I've rebelled. And that's what I've learned by, what was the phrase you used earlier, being crushed or whatever? <laughs> being brought to your knees? Yes, yes. yes. And in part, I think that, that wisdom, and I think I've learned this too, both from what the, the great saints teach as well as from experience, Wisdom consists in large part of understanding the extent to which you are not in control of things. Mm. Because what it finally comes down to is you're not even in control of your own soul. Mm. That it's all grace. It's mm. just all grace and all goodness, believe it or not. Which mm. is hard to say after saying I've been brought to my knees 20 times or six times. <laughs> but it's all grace. Yes. But that you don't come to by reason. Yeah, it's a learning. As in that scripture uh, <clears throat> of, that I read to... Uh, do not be ashamed to confess your sins. You know, it's calling us to face up to our inadequacies, our failures, our need for God's mercy yes. and grace. And as one of the books that you publish about kindness, it's, it's this whole journey faces up to who we are in our yes. deep need for God in our life. Yeah. Was the search, uh, would you agree that, um, that we are to strive even to death for the truth? Sure. It's a worthy quest. What, what, what good is my life if it's not in conformity with what Christ teaches and what I'm called to? Right. Sure, give it in a second. John, thank you very much for joining yeah. us on Journey Home. Thank, thank you for you. your witness and also the work you do with Sophia Press. Thank you for the books you publish are of great value to us in our journey. Thank, thank you, you very Marcus. much. And thank you for joining us on the Journey Home. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Let's keep each other in prayer as we walk the journey following Jesus Christ as he calls us to follow faithfully. 